Hi, I'm James, and I'd like to start today's video by thanking Innerdisk and Sims for providing the products featured in it. Innerdisk produce industrial and embedded products from DRAM and flash storage devices to a wide range of specialist embedded peripherals, including AI accelerators, IO expansion cards, and storage adapters. That also includes what we are featuring in the video today, which is this little thing, the EGPL T101. Sims are the UK distributor for Innerdisk products and can supply them with no minimum order quantity or value. Perfect for those like myself looking to source components for a project, whether that be a single device or thousands. You can find links to both the Innerdisk and Sims websites in the description below. And so without further ado, let's take a look at the EGPL T101 and we will also dive into some of their offerings and options later on. Taking a look at the device itself, and what we have is a M2 2280 B plus M key device. What this means is that it is 80 mils long, and we have these two notches for the B and M keys, meaning it is a PCI Express 3.0 two times device. That means although uh, a full M2 slot can provide four lanes of PCI Express bandwidth, this particular card only utilizes two of them. This is because that is all that is really necessary. With PCI Express 3.0 two times providing 16 gigabytes of bandwidth, this is more than adequate for providing the bandwidth required for the 10 gigabit networking. It does mean, however, if you are using this in a slot that only provides PCI Express 2.0 throughput, that you will be limited to a maximum of eight gigabits, which will give some limits uh, if you are using this at the full 10 gigabit speed for your network connection. What this means in real terms is that you can expect transfer speeds, assuming that both devices are 10 gigabit, and that you have the relevant I.O. throughput elsewhere in the system to get around 1.25 gigabytes per second of throughput with these adapters, maybe a little less depending on efficiency of the network protocol. Of course, what we can see is quite clearly missing from this is we have no RJ45 connector, and this comes in the form of this separate piece which can be placed inside or outside of your system chassis and the two of these are connected using a special ribbon cable here which although it goes to a thick end on each piece has a thin wrapped cable which makes it fairly easy to run within or through a little access hole in your system. While this is a M2-2280 form factor device, compared to this SSD here, we can see that it is going to be significantly thicker, particularly with the heatsink. However, we also have these additional components, which have a higher Z height than you will find on your typical SSD. Uh, and this does limit in some cases where you can use this device. It will not fit into anything where you have its own heatsink which needs to sit on top or if you want to do that you will have to modify or omit the heatsink and obviously this heatsink can sometimes also block other components in the system. Looking at the dimensions of it the heatsink sits roughly 11 mil above the surface of the PCB and also the clip for it extends down around 2 mil below. Because of the way it is mounted as well, it is actually slightly wider than your standard M2 devices because this metal is down either side. So when choosing a device like this for a project, it is worth making sure that you have the clearance to fit it. Now the reason for me that these cards were so interesting is that they start to offer new ways that you can implement um, 10 gigabit ethernet into your projects or systems. Now in this case, this is a PCI Express riser card um, from my server build, which I will be featuring soon on this channel again. And this breaks down a 16 times PCI Express port 
into four four lane M2 slots. So with this, I can attach SSDs and also the 10 gigabit ethernet card um, and using PCIe bifurcation on the X570 platform supported by the ASRock rack board that I'm using here, we can treat these as four separate devices plugged into a single slot. I also have a similar card installed in my main workstation. And in this case, while I have a spare PCI Express slot, which I could install a 10 gigabit ethernet PCI Express card into, what I don't have is a lot of clearance between that and the graphics card, the 3080 in this system. And so rather than risk starving the graphics card of cooling, by installing a very close proximity card to it blocking the fans, I opted instead to use that riser card to install one of these M2 cards and that keeps a bit more flexibility because I still have two slots left for additional SSDs in future and without crowding the graphics card with that really close proximity card. Another example of how this could be used is this Topton Mini PC, which I have previously featured on the channel. Um, this has a M2 slot here, already occupied by the SSD. And if we are to flip the main board over, we can see that on the other side, we have installed the uh, 101 or T101 in the second M2 slot. And actually the heatsink is roughly the same height as the main heatsink for this system. And then from here, it's some case of we can attach the lead for the RJ45 cable, thread it through this cutout in the board. And of course you would need to, so this works fine for testing purposes. If you were using this as a long-term solution, you would want to find a way of cutting and mounting the RJ45 port into this chassis. But for my testing, I have been sitting it like this so that the cable comes through here and the connector can come out. And then we could either cut the lid or make a cut in the other side of the chassis to mount this connector in. Another great candidate for these M2 modules are micro ATX or ITX builds where you may have a couple of M2 slots. Uh, here we have a board where we have two on the front. An SSD could be fitted under the graphics card while the PCI Express slots are obscured by a large graphics card. Or on a ITX board like this we have a slot on the front where the heatsink could be emitted and the M2 10 gigabit ethernet card fitted. Whilst to the rear, you could fit the M2 SSD, or if you have clearance or can cut into the chassis to make room for the heatsink, could fit the 10 gigabit ethernet card there. Of course, there are limitations with this approach. Here, if we look at the ASUS PN50 small form factor system uh, and Intel NUCs will often be similar. So if we were willing to compromise and say we would use SATA storage, we could free up the M2 slot in this, fitting the drive, it's, uh, the card itself is fairly tricky as you've got to angle it in and clearance in here is not great. But even once it is in place, we then find ourselves with no usable storage in this chassis because the heatsink from the network card then blocks the SATA port. So you are going to find this is not a perfect solution for all small form factor machines, but if you have a suitable system or if you've done your research and built something with it in mind, then it can be a really good way of adding that extra functionality to a system. Now for mounting the connector in my main workstation, I have printed out this not for great quality, but fine for testing, a 3D printed backplate connector. And this just allows me with the little mounting brackets uh, to screw the connector in. It was very quickly modeled up from a backplate that I found on Thingiverse and then just some cutouts made. And fortunately, um, InnerDisc give very good um, dimensions for these. So I was able to model this up and print it successfully first time. With the server, mounting was even easier. This board actually has another version which has additional LAN ports, uh, so I was able to just drill two holes into the back panel and utilise one of the connectors there. 
and with everything installed into the chassis we can see that the cable has plenty of room to loop round to the port mounted to the back of the machine. Of course to pair up with our 10 gigabit network cards we have to have a 10 gigabit switch and I have gone for the Unify Flex XG. Um, this has four 10 gigabit ports and a one gigabit power over ethernet in um, and basically to go 10 gigabit throughout my network would be both somewhat unnecessary and very very expensive even this with just four ports uh, was around 250 pound but it does perfectly integrate with my existing unify setup and gives me sort of that critical path between my server and workstations so that they get the full communication speed and we can really take advantage of SSD storage in these devices to transfer things quickly between them. Out of the box, there is no native driver support for this controller in Windows 10, 11 or Server 2022. But looking at the device ID, we can identify it as the Marvel Action AQC 113. Innerdisk provide a driver pack on their website. And in this, we can find Linux and Windows drivers, with Marvel also stating there is support for FreeBSD 12 and VMware ESXi. The Windows driver pack only takes a few seconds to install, being a very basic driver set with no additional applications. And with that, we can see our device is now recognized in Device Manager and ready to use. To compare the performance with Gigabit Ethernet, I used the built-in Realtek controller on the mini PC along with the InnoDisk 10 Gigabit Ethernet controller. First of all, with a selection of image and video files, and then secondly, with a set of ISO files. Um, obviously, as you would expect, the um, larger ISO files give a higher overall throughput. Unfortunately, the peak transfer speeds um, on sustained workloads did fall off, which I think is to do with the SSD caching that I'm using in my server. So copying 65 gigabytes of data in that test, it did drop off. I did notice that despite the power draw increasing only three watts compared to the standard ethernet controller in this system, uh, that the heatsink does get quite warm. So it is also possible there is some throttling in effect, but I don't believe that is the case. Uh, I like I say, I think that was to do with the caching that I use for the drive. Even so, with the two test scenarios, the performance improvement was in the sort of 3.99 to 5.4 times performance improvement. And this could go all the way up to almost a 10 times improvement. I have seen in some of the file transfers that I have done off camera, um, read and write speeds of over 1.1 gigabytes per second, uh, which is getting very close to the 1.25 gigabyte theoretical maximum for 10 gigabit. So overall in my testing, it does show that these modules produce the kind of performance that you would hope for from a 10 gigabit ethernet controller, but also highlights that with these kind of speeds, you do need the IO throughput elsewhere in the system to cope with it. Um, so, you know, mechanical storage purely on its own is not going to be able to take advantage of these. You do need NVMe storage somewhere in there because even a SATA SSD is not going to provide enough performance to really maximize the 10 gigabit link here. So it's safe to say what InnoDisk have created in the eGPL T101 is a really interesting product. It isn't something which is going to be useful for everyone for a lot of builds a PCI Express card may be your best option. But for those specific projects where form factor or availability of slots, or even just wanting to cram more into a limited number of slots is an issue, this is one of those really niche but invaluable products.